Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome. Um, for those who may not know me, my name is John Thompson. I'm the Associate Vice President of Research, and I'm also Professor Emeritus in Biology. And on behalf of the Office of Research, and indeed our President, uh, Ferdinand Hamdel Lepper, and our Vice President Research, uh, Charmaine Dean, it's a singular pleasure for me to welcome you to the third research talk uh, for the fall 2017 series of research talks. And I'd like to extend a special welcome to staff and students uh, who are here. Indeed, it bears noting that these research talks are meant to provide an opportunity for all members of the UW community, faculty, students, and staff, to learn firsthand about the exciting research that's being done at our institution. Our speaker today is Professor Sarah Birch <coughs> from the Department of Geography and Environmental Management. Dr. Birch holds a Canada Research Chair in Sustainability, Governance and Innovation, and she's also a Senior Fellow at the Centre for International Governance Innovation and a Fellow at the Balsillie School of International Affairs. And just this year, Sarah is a newly elected member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists. Indeed, she will be inducted into the College of the Royal Society at a very special ceremony uh, next week. Today, Dr. Birch is going to talk about the key ingredients of effective sustainability governance in cities and how initiatives led by cities accelerate the complex process of transformation toward more prosperous, just, and sustainable patterns of development. Her research focuses in general on governing responses to climate change in urban spaces and of course in that context is extremely relevant. She explores triggers of transitions towards more sustainable development pathways and strategies for engaging a variety of actors in conservation, in conversations rather, about desirable futures. Sarah is the North American coordinator of the Earth System Governance Project and is one of the faculty members teaching in the Masters of Climate Change program. Some of her current projects employ comparative policy analysis and institutional theory combined with the concepts of path dependency and sustainability transitions, all to investigate how communities use stocks of capacity in responding to climate change. She also examines unique partnerships between the public and private sectors that may serve to transform regional development paths and mitigate climate change, as well as the use of green infrastructure to achieve both adaptation to and mitigation of climate change, and, and I find this interesting, the triggers of climate change leadership in Canadian communities. Sarah received a Bachelor of Arts with distinction in international relations and and I find this very interesting, a Bachelor of Science, first class honors in environmental science. So she has two degrees, one in the humanities and one in the sciences, both from the University of Calgary. And then she went on to receive a PhD in resource management and environmental studies from the University of British Columbia. She also held a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Oxford's Environmental Change Institute, and then a Banting postdoctoral fellowship at the University of British Columbia before coming to Waterloo. And are we glad that you chose to come to Waterloo, Sarah? Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sarah Birch to the podium. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, thanks so much for being here today. I'm really excited to sort of reach beyond my 
beyond my faculty, beyond my department, to see faces I've never seen before and, and be part of this uh, very exciting series of research talks. Um, and thank you for that extremely kind and detailed introduction. Uh, you know more about me than I know now. Uh, so today my goal is to expose you to uh, some of the sort of big ideas that I and my team are grappling with, some of the theory that we draw upon to help us explore pathways to sustainability, particularly in urban spaces, some of the empirical work that we're doing and how that's helping us to inform, uh, in particular, Canadian policy. So we are some of these tainted academics who uh, are all deeply interdisciplinary, often from the very beginning, and feel that it's our responsibility to engage in conversations about uh, real life issues, practice, policy, decision making. So we cross that boundary between scholar and sometimes activist, sometimes advisor. Uh, so I'll be talking a little bit about, about that today. Um, this is my plan, Whoop. and this is my trigger, here we go. So I'm going to make the case for you today with just a couple of quick slides relying on some of the sort of most leading edge, I think, uh, science on transformations to make the case to you that um, we can view transformations in two ways. One is we are in the midst of one, whether we like it or not. The other is perhaps we don't want the current transformation we're in the midst of. We want something different. We want something um, that more closely aligns with our values or our vision of the future. So then that begs the question, so what do we do if we want a different pattern of change than we're seeing? So I'll build a little bit of evidence using a few indicators for the fact that we are, find ourselves in the midst of this transformation. And then I'm going to ask a few questions. You know, we always end with more questions than we answered, but I'm going to sort of try and answer them. And hopefully you'll see how my varied interests and, and, uh, and different disciplinary sort of uh, foundations weave together to answer these questions. What is transformation anyway? It's a big word. It's a sexy word. We hear it a lot. Uh, but we are grappling with what it means in practice. Uh, who participates and how? This gets back to my sort of uh, core as a governance scholar. So who gets to make decisions about transformation? How do we engage them better? We have some new survey data that's hot off the presses from about three weeks ago that I and my team will point to constantly. There's three of them sitting right there. Um, have, been, have been chewing on uh, since the summer. Uh, and we're about to head into the field in January to ask even more questions about who participates and how. I'll talk a little bit about the pathways to transformation and tools, methods we can use to explore them. These are complex phenomena. It's hard to wrap our puny little human brains around them, but we're trying. Uh, and then finally, this crucial question of how can we accelerate progress towards a more fundamentally sustainable pathway. Um, and ending with right here at home, what does this mean for Canada? Uh, you may know that there are negotiations just wrapping up today. Is this the last day of Bonn? Um, climate change negotiations in Bonn, Germany, sort of following on the Paris Agreement, trying to figure out what the world is doing, given really interesting uh, signals south of the border and other complex dynamics behind climate change policy right now. So what does all of this mean for Canadian uh, sustainability and climate change and decarbonization policy. That's where I will end up. Okay, we are in a time of change. Um, looking at the planet from a more sort of, sort of natural science or ecological perspective, we have this relatively new um, uh, contribution from Will Steffen and, and others arguing that we can uh, look at the planet as, uh, as being comprised of nine different boundaries that sort of define a safe space within which humans can operate with relative comfort, health, equity, justice. But those more complicated issues are sort of in the background here. So we have these nine planetary boundaries that matter to us and to living systems on Earth. If we cross the threshold of those boundaries, if we push those systems beyond these boundaries identified by, by ecologists and others, 
we risk moving into a place where there are sort of catastrophic continental or planetary scale impacts. So these are major Earth systems that we are tinkering with without really considering the implications. They include novel entities. This is a goofy word because we're trying to figure out what this means. Novel entities means things like pollution, uh, radioactive materials, nanoparticles, so stuff that we're really just saying, wow, what's this and what does this mean for people 200 or 1,000 years from now? So no, we are, we are currently incapable really of measuring this particular boundary. Ozone depletion, atmospheric aerosol loading, the acidification of the oceans, biogeochemical flows like phosphorus and nitrogen, freshwater use, land use change, biosphere integrity, which is mostly biodiversity, and of course, the Whopper climate change. Um, two of these, biosphere integrity and climate change, are considered by these folks to be what they would call core boundaries. So if we transgress the boundaries on these two fronts, it kicks the whole planet into a different state. And you can use your imagination and think about why. Climate change impacts everything we do, right? The safety of our cities, our food supply, our water, etc. So we know already, we have evidence on the ones we can measure that we have, in fact, transgressed four of those boundaries already. So we're already into unknown territory on biodiversity. We're in the middle of a mass extinction triggered by us, climate change, biogeochemical flows, and land system change. So this is a pretty dire warning. Um, and I have some difficulty with it for two reasons, one of which is we're all here today and yet we've crossed some of these thresholds. So boundaries are a little bit deceptive, deceiving, not super helpful. We don't fall off the edge of anything when we transgress this boundary, we're still here. So we have to think about what to do next and what the world is going to look like. Um, furthermore, where are the people? This is why I had to do <laughs> two degrees um, in my undergraduate was that this masks all of the complex kind of social and political uh, dynamics that give rise to all of this stuff. So this tells us something about the physical system and nothing about the social system at all. So before we help remedy that, let's zoom in on this core boundary, this climate change one that's sort of closest to my heart, I guess. This will be familiar to many of you you are the choir, I would imagine, um, on the climate change front. But this is um, a series of records of the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's been taken for the last 50 years or so at the Mauna Loa Observatory, uh, showing this stock of carbon in the atmosphere. And you'll see this nice, lovely, jagged line like this. The jaggedness of the line is just essentially the planet breathing in and breathing out each year. So uh, in the summer, in the northern hemisphere summer, plants and trees green up and grow and suck carbon out of the atmosphere and the concentration goes down slightly. When all of those leaves fall and decompose, that carbon is released back into the atmosphere and the planet exhales and we see the carbon dioxide concentrations go up. So this is what's happening every year. This is normal. We expect this. But this is not normal. This gradual, sort of steady, inevitable increase is not normal, nor is it desirable. But any good scientist would say, yeah, but zoom out, right? Another 100 years or whatever, and this will be a blip, and this is just part of the noise, and, and uh, this isn't as dramatic as it might seem. But of course it is. So if we go back over 10,000 years, which is significant because this is the bulk of human history, right? This is like when we've been having cities and agriculture and trying to write things down. This is uh, over the last 10,000 years, and here is where we find ourselves with the concentration of carbon dioxide. Let's go back 800,000 years, like way longer than matters to any of us, and here we are. Bonk. This is where we find ourselves with the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's stark, and we know very clearly, compellingly, the relationship between carbon dioxide emissions and rising temperatures. What does this mean? Well, if we were standing here today and the temperatures were three degrees cooler, there'd be a kilometer of ice above our heads. If the temperatures are about two degrees warmer, sea levels would be about five to eight meters higher. So two degrees of warming 
which is what we're already on track for, we're committed already to pretty close to that, is shocking in terms of its effects for human civilization. This is why climate change is one of those core boundaries, and this is why it is a very serious challenge. But as I mentioned, those planetary boundaries give us only one slice of the equation. There are people and economies uh, behind all of that. And this is what is attempted to be represented here in what, are, what scholars are calling the Great Acceleration. This is further evidence of this transformation that we find ourselves in, whether we like it or not. That on a whole load of socioeconomic fronts, and what you could call Earth system trends, but are closely, obviously tied to the socioeconomic trends, we see in the space of one lifetime, an exponential, nonlinear escalation in all sorts of ways, from transportation to tourism to paper production. An earlier version of this had, I think it was, number of Big Macs consumed or something. <laughs> totally important indicator of human civilization. Um, primary energy use, real GDP, et cetera. Um, very few of these are leveling off now into a more sustainable territory, and those that are are, that, that are, are typically doing so because we've reached the threshold of, of capacity constraints, like crashing fish stocks. So turns out you can't fish the fish that aren't there. Um, there's one that is particularly interesting to me, and that is this rapid escalation of the urban population. This is a dynamic of transformation that collides with climate change in all kinds of interesting ways and creates remarkable challenges for us. So what are we seeing if we delve a bit deeper into that urban population dynamic? So these little buildings here show um, percentage of the global population living in urban areas in 1990, a couple years ago, and projected into the future. So in North America, we're largely urbanized already, right? Three quarters of people here already live in cities. But we expect that that will be 87% by 2050. Even globally, two thirds of the world's population will live in cities by 2050, by mid-century. This is where the majority of the humans are. Put another way, we see this steady decline of rural residents, marked by, as you would imagine, the inverse, or the percentage of urban participants. Right here, we see this you know, tipping point, this change. Around 2008, 2009, more people lived in cities than in, urban, than in rural areas. So we are, whether we like it or not, in the middle of the largest migration in human history from rural areas to cities. Why does this matter? Well, you put a whole lot of people in one space. They can't produce their own food. They have to get their food from somewhere else. So you have a lot of people who are very um, dependent on the production capacity of some other place, uh, often with some other politics, some other uh, um, democratic or not structure, economic structure, et cetera. So we are all pressed together we consume a lot of resources, we need a lot of resources, and often we choose to put cities in really beautiful places like coastlines, <laughs> and sometimes on top of fault lines, and other uh, interesting dynamics. So we put our cities, millions and millions of people, in deeply vulnerable places, and then we must be reliant on other communities elsewhere to feed us and water us and keep us alive. So we have all these people in cities. What kind of cities are we building? But what kind of cities do we want? This is the question. So um, this is one image of the way that a lot of cities look in Canada, right? This is kind of familiar, especially in this area and really where I'm from, Manitoba and throughout Alberta. You see cities like this all the time. Very low density, big wide streets, easy to drive down, kind of sucks to walk. Not much in the way of tree cover, gardens, it's really meant for driving. And so these, because we have this luxury of space in Canada and throughout the US, our cities grow and grow and grow in very low density formats that are incredibly resource intensive to service. 
So can we use our imaginations? This is the question that I pose to you and that we all work on. Can we use our imaginations to envision urban spaces that respond to those sustainability challenges, the imperative for transformation, um, that align with our values, that respond to these challenges and are more deeply sustainable? Of course we can. It's a fraught and contested process. But we could transform that space into something dramatically more sustainable. What do we see going on? All kinds of things. We have active transportation. We have mass transportation. We have sort of small scale food um, delivery, if not production. But maybe there's not just flowers here. There's food growing as well. This looks like a permeable surface to me. So when it rains a lot or when it floods, uh, the water goes into the sidewalk instead of rushing over and creating floods. We have uh, renewable energy, micro renewable energy production, solar there. Uh, we have a compact mixed use development, so we don't just have single family detached homes and then you have to get in your car and drive 15 minutes to get a coffee. So you can work and play and live in the same place. These are all characteristics of sustainable urban development that we can stretch our imaginations um, and create in our urban spaces. And we have examples of these. There are neighborhoods like this. There are cities like this. Um, we just need to learn the stories of how they got to be that way and have a conversation about what we want our own community to look like. But there are two things that are invisible in this image that I want to sort of draw your attention to because this is what we delve deeper into. One is there are rules that are invisible. Um, this is the governance scholar in me. There are bylaws. There are carbon taxes. There are fuel efficiency standards. There are residential zoning standards. There's all kinds of rules that make this what it is that you can't see on the surface. There are also values that are invisible, right? Uh, whether that's social cohesion or gender equality or equitable distribution of wealth or public health, all of these values are also invisible here and yet give rise to it. So it's those issues, those invisible rules and those invisible values that we have to sort of identify and cultivate to trigger a transformation along this pathway. How to get from A to B is indeed the question. And starting about seven or eight years ago, um, and perhaps long before this, but maybe when this is just, this is when it sort of started pinging on my radar. You know, during the intergovernmental panel on climate change um, processes, the assessment reports and, and the international negotiations on climate change, we started hearing more about this word transformation. And I think it might have been because the data we're rolling in suggesting that in fact, despite really ambitious efforts to develop international treaties on climate change, our progress was quite incremental. So we were, and are still not on track <laughs> to meeting our climate change goals by any stretch. So we saw a growing push towards using this language of radical action, of transformation, of system-wide change. And that started cropping up in the scholarly literature all over the place in different disciplines, uh, sociological systems, socio-technical transitions, all kinds of stuff, governance, policy analysis. Uh, it started cropping up in major international research initiatives that were sort of multi-country collaboratives and also even in consultancies and international research platforms. So it really gained steam, the idea of needing a transformation or being in the middle of one and the challenges that we faced in governing that transformation uh, really sort of cropped up over the last few years. So what is it actually? What is a transformation? Who's been thinking about it? How, do, how can we think about it? Well, generally speaking, um, you know, there are, there are a whole suite of approaches, but we agree that a transformation has to be different from incrementalism. It has to be different from a sort of steady linear change in a system. So this comes back to a lot of sort of systems thinking. It is a fundamental or non-linear shift. It's an exponential change. And often in sort of the underlying core logic of a system, not just how it performs, but why it performs, what it does. What do cities do? What is the role of a city? Um, what should our food system provide you with? What is its purpose? These dramatic changes in how we think about a system uh, are what we call transformations. Um, so if we're aiming for this desirable transformation towards sustainability rather than incremental change, 
we have to start thinking then about the root causes of risk rather than just the symptoms, rather than just um, the things that we can change on the surface. So this is underlying distribution of wealth, um, public engagement in, in uh, democratic processes, et cetera. Another sort of domain of theory um, has been talking about the idea of transformation. They typically use the word transition, and there are differences in, in how this is framed. But um, largely out of a very active set of Dutch scholars, there is a field called sociotechnical transitions theory. And the whole point of this is to start thinking about, um, let's say, an urban system or really any system as not just technologies. It's not just widgets. This is a really important conversation to have here on this particular campus. That technologies, of course, are embedded in social fabric, in social systems, in our values, in our politics, in the way we make decisions about things. We can't divorce the two. If you create a technology, there's no guarantee it's going to be taken up, right? It has to be um, aligned with values. It is performed in some way by people, and it's governed as well. So these socio-technical transitions weaving together the social and the technical, these usually involve really far-reaching changes, a broad range of actors, not just one. For the political scientists among us, we often focus on formal government. That's not the only nor the most important actor in the governance of sustainability, as we'll come to see, um, and take considerable time spans to unfold. The socio-technical folks rely on this iconic image. <laughs> it's iconic in my world, probably nobody else's, from 2002, uh, that tries to describe these dynamics of innovation and stability in a socio-technical system. So starting way at the top, we have these broad, slow to change, big landscapes. So um, this is not something that you or I have control over. This is the economic system. This is the sort of materiality of our world, like what resources we actually have access to, this kind of thing. We set up an interwoven set of rules here, like markets. And we have knowledge here. We have what they would call sort of regimes in the center. This uh, experiences more change than the sort of high level landscape. And down here at the technological niche level, this is where we have the innovations. This is what they would call the protected space where a, a niche innovation can occur. It can be a new technology, a new social practice that challenges the standard way of doing things. And if it fits, if it is cultivated, it can rise up to challenge the dominant mode of doing things, the dominant technology. Um, but those, that the, the ways in which those niche innovations actually grow to challenge the incumbent are, are delicate. And so we have lots of failed innovations over time. Part of our challenge in getting from here to here when it comes to a renewable energy system, moving off oil and gas and moving towards renewable or whatever, um, is that we have lots and lots and lots of experiments in niche spaces not much in the way of learning from those experiments. So this figure, for instance, uh, was the brainchild of Chris Luderitz, who's sitting there, um, a doctoral student of mine, and a, a suite of uh, colleagues, about a dozen or so colleagues, who are trying to think about how experiments um, in sustainability transformations come about, what goes into them and what comes out of them, and then how we can share those lessons to kind of build momentum behind a sustainability transition that we want. So um, what's needed is this kind of framework, you know, a way to think about all of these different experience, experiments rather, that are so abundant and so interesting, um, but that rarely are shared. And that is thinking about what goes into them what is done in the process of the experiment, like collaboration, for instance, um, what comes out the other side, like actionable knowledge and real world changes, and then how it gets back to those root causes, right? What has actually changed fundamentally about the system as a result of that experiment um, that might have ripple effects, that might come up to challenge the regime and ultimately shift the landscape?
But what we still don't know from this, so now we have a suite of experiments. We've think, thought about what goes into it and what comes out of it. We need to pay more attention, in my mind, to who does the experiment. Who is responsible? Who actually makes the innovation? Um, and how do we govern that innovation? This is a governance question then, right? This brings us around to governance. So rather than focusing only on government, on organized formal government, we think about governance as a broader process, right? Interactions between all different kinds of actors, including networks, like international networks of municipalities, including civil society, nonprofit organizations, um, and including the private sector. In particular, small businesses, which is where I'm coming to and where we focus a lot of our energy these days. So we know that governing sustainability and governing climate change is not so simple as ascribing responsibility to one level of government. It's a collaborative, fluid, ever-evolving process uh, where power shifts um, and the outcomes are unclear. The role of the private sector, in particular small businesses, was largely ignored in political science at least, not in other disciplines. Um, but even in the business administration and, and, and other disciplines, small businesses were this kind of invisible set of actors. And there's a lot of kind of good, well, interesting, not good, interesting reasons why that is. Um, so we are starting to take more seriously as governance scholars and as sustainability scholars the role that entrepreneurs can play. And it just so happened that this, I feel like this fits very beautifully with a lot of what Waterloo does, with a focus on entrepreneurship and innovation, but also socially responsible, just sustainable innovation. So that is what, what our team is working on. So we know that entrepreneurs are really interesting because they're often quite agile. It's their job to read the landscape and find opportunities where others missed them. So, hey, that sounds like a perfect role for an innovator or an experimenter. Somebody who can come up with that niche innovation that can challenge the incumbent, right? They are willing to take more risks than someone like me, maybe. Um, but they are embedded. They're not, you know, we don't have this sort of strong man or, you, you know, individualistic view of an entrepreneur. They are social creatures. They're embedded in their culture. We tend to ignore small businesses because individually, they, um, their impact on climate and sustainability is fairly minuscule, right? Their individual emissions are nothing like the emissions of Walmart, which are equivalent to a medium-sized country. Um, so we tend to ignore them. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. They have very diverse motivations. They have come in all different shapes and sizes. So how on earth can we wrap our arms around what small businesses um, actually can do on climate change. And yet, they contribute about 60% of our commercial emissions, greenhouse gas emissions in total. They um, employ about 90% of our private labor force. So the big ones are important, but not that important. Small businesses employ almost all of the people in the private sector. Um, and they produce uh, just over half of the private sector GDP. So collectively, they're super important. Individually, they're easy to ignore. So we think small businesses can be these agents of change, can be the innovators at the niche scale that can translate up into a system-wide shift. And there are so many of them with great examples. River Market and Westminster Key that reduced its emissions. This is focused entirely on climate change by 24% in two years. Um, so when you think about the, the targets that countries are setting to reduce emissions by, well, the Waterloo targets are something like 6% by 2020. Is that right? Anyone who knows? Um, you know, double, triple, quadruple what municipalities and what um, countries are proposing in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions. That is because they have total control over their own operations in a lot of ways and they're quite agile and can do this. But they come up with really cool solutions for diverting waste, for reducing their, their energy consumption. Aggressive tube bending, which is an awesome name for a steel manufacturer. In, in Surrey that replaced its old air compressors and for a very low cost and an almost insignificant payback period transformed its own greenhouse gas uh, profile. There are thousands of these all around the world. There are great examples. Um, but that framework that I mentioned earlier for evaluating how that experiment happens is a really important ingredient of figuring out how to do more of this faster. So that is partly what the Governing and Accelerating Transformative Entrepreneurship Team, three of whom are there, Arvind Kunderby, Chris Luderitz, and Scott Morton-Ninomia, 
Also missing from this picture are Alex Mercado and uh, Linda Westman. So those are the, the gate team that are working on these questions. Of trying to understand what a holistic picture of community-led um, innovation on sustainability might look like. What role do these unusual suspects, these groups that we forget about, what, can they, what role can they play in transformations to sustainability? And how can we better govern urban spaces to assist them? So we are grappling with what influences small businesses and both from the outside and from the inside in terms of their, their innovation on sustainability. And this is one way that we think about that. So there are external uh, conditions uh, that affect the transformative potential of individual small businesses. So if we gather them together as a group, what potential do they have to transform the development pathway of an urban space towards something that's more sustainable? And that could be government regulation, markets, civil society and consumers' values, etc. But internally, there are also dynamics that affect whether or not a, sustainability, a small business rather will innovate on sustainability, like organizational dynamics, decision-making and leadership, the capacity they have, the money, the knowledge, the human resources, um, the business culture, whether or not taking risks is encouraged, whether or not business operations aligning with the owner and manager's values is important. Uh, these kind of internal dynamics affect the transformative potential then of small businesses and whether or not they will come up with ultimately a new technology or social practice, a new business model, service product, um, and reduced environmental impact. And I would say not just reduced environmental impact, but transformed environmental impact, or what we would even call regenerative uh, impact. So actually creating good instead of doing slightly less bad. So these dynamics are what we have just been trying to analyze using a large sample size survey. Uh, for those of you who do large survey work, <laughs> it can be a traumatic experience. <laughs> And I won't use this opportunity for catharsis, <laughs> but um, we administered a survey uh, in Canada. We tried in London, and it didn't work, and we can't explain why. Um, but in Toronto and Vancouver, we uh, received about 1,730 responses, which is, as far as we can tell, one of the largest small business and sustainability surveys, certainly in the literature. I would imagine private sector companies do uh, larger ones that are kept under wraps, but um, this is one of the largest out there in our field. Um, we approached about 30,000 businesses to participate. Uh, we faced, and I faced, uh, significant challenges related to Canada's anti-spam legislation. This is part of my trauma. but. Um, we, this is new legislation, there's not much jurisprudence on what it means to violate this, and we were very, 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 very cautious that we didn't, and yet, um, perceived unsolicited emails <laughs> sparked some fairly fierce reactions from a couple of small businesses who received invitations. So this was just all part of the interesting process of administering a survey to this many people. Um, and just as, a, as far as a taste of, of what we found, we asked small businesses a whole lot of things, but one of the questions was, what benefits do you see? Uh, what, what benefits do you perceive in making progress on sustainability? And we're fairly confident, uh, because of our sample size and response rate, that we are not just preaching to the choir here. We didn't just get the sustainability innovators, which is part of the reason why we wanted to do a large sample size survey, instead of interviewing only the 20 or 30 leaders that we know would give us the answers we want. This is a bit broader than that. And a point that I just want to highlight here is, number one, the, the most important benefit or commonly reported benefit that businesses gave was improving their reputation in the community. That's interesting. Cost savings was not number one, which is how we typically kind of caricature a small business. They're all about the bottom line. They're starved for cash. If only we give them a little bit of money or some incentive or whatever, they'll change their behavior. Costs matter. It's number two. It's not insignificant but right up there is reputation. So they see themselves as part of their community and both costs and, and their role in their community matter to them in terms of a benefit to responding to sustainability. Increasing sales is interestingly low. <laughs> so maybe they don't see the customer demand for it. I guess we could talk about that. 
We also ask them about those external factors. So let's position the small business in, con in the context of everything else it can do and impact. So when you make progress on sustainability, what kind of impacts are you trying to have? Who are you trying to influence? Well, a lot of them said, as you might imagine, user or consumer habits. Um, and a more sort of higher level, kind of potentially transformative dimension of markets. They don't see themselves as policy influencers. They see themselves as takers of policy, not makers of policy, which is perhaps not surprising. And the, the last point I want to make here is, about, is just regarding all the barriers that small businesses face. And I've done a smaller version of the survey in the past, and generally they say, everything's a barrier, and we need help from everyone, is the answer. And that kind of came up again, that they do say they lack time, they lack money, they la lack staff. These are the barriers that small businesses face when it's five people or six people and none of them is the, can be the devoted sustainability person. How on earth do they come up with new solutions and move forward? So then this raises the question, who can provide the, that capacity? Who can partner up with small businesses to help them overcome those capacity gaps and do what they do best and innovate in this space? There are obvious answers to that question. Government at multiple levels, civil society groups, and us. <laughs> Researchers can play a role in helping bid, build capacity in small businesses to make these changes. So we're moving into the field in January to do deeper qualitative stuff. So this is what, the qualitative stuff is what many of us, it's where we feel most at home, sitting down with the small businesses, with a municipal um, staff person or a, a policymaker, and really get to the heart of the question and talk to them for an hour and a half. So this is sort of the deeper qualitative stuff that we're going to go into with all of these remaining questions. So, I mean, we need to constantly reflect back we have made some conclusions, or some, we have the hypothesis that, that small businesses matter. Collectively, they can be transformative. But can they really, or are their hands just tied? They're in the supply chain of bigger businesses. They just have no choice. They rent their property. They probably don't own it. How do you change? You know, there's all of these problems that small businesses face. Um, but our ultimate question is, how do we weave this small business progress into the whole, into this system-wide transformation that we're attempting to drive towards? That is the question. So that brings us to the issue of what pathways can we follow and what tools can we use to explore those pathways uh, towards this deeper system-wide transformation. On this point, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of sort of assertions that have been made about ways we can uh, move towards transformation. One is just scaling up an intervention. So just do more of it in more places, faster, bigger scale. That leads to a transformation. Others view transformation as something that happens after we've done a lot of incremental stuff and we've reached the limits of that and now we have to do something totally different. The issue that we've been sort of mentioning here today the most often is this root cause pathway, getting at the underlying um, drivers of vulnerability to climate change and the underlying drivers of high emissions pathways and huge resource consumption, irresponsible resource consumption. So that's the one that we often focus the most on. And one great example in urban spaces of how this can be done is by taking greenhouse gas reduction over here, which we call mitigation, and we take adaptation over here, which is responding to the impacts of something like climate change, right? So climate change is happening, we didn't reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And now there's floods, so we need to protect ourselves, Or we need to rotate crops so that they will succeed in a different climate. That's adaptation. And finding where they intersect and developing strategies for urban spaces that do both. Can be done. <laughs> so adaptation is this kind of thing. Planting new forests or reforesting previously deforested areas, flood responses, emergency responses, et cetera. Mitigation is energy efficiency, renewable energy, sustainable transport. But in the middle, we have issues or options like green infrastructure. So this is using living systems, ecosystems, like wetlands, for instance, to do things that hard or gray infrastructure did before. So we know that wetlands purify water. We know that they are great flood protection uh, mechanisms. So they can sink carbon, because they're green and growing things. They can purify water. They can enhance biodiversity. They can. Um, build public health by being recreational opportunities. 
Um, they can improve the aesthetics of a community. Green infrastructure, using a living system to do what gray infrastructure did before, can deliver all of those co-benefits if we know what we're doing. Small businesses rarely grapple with these synergies. This is sort of, you know, beyond the scope of their day-to-day -day business. But finding these synergies really offers an opportunity for co-benefits, for benefits on multiple fronts, and it also expands the group of people that you're, that you're bringing in, an, into your tent when you're proposing climate change and sustainability strategies in urban spaces. We have methods for exploring how these pathways unfold in cities. A lot of these are comparative, as I've, as I've described before. Because we're crossing this boundary from the sort of distant objective scholar, although we should all question whether we've ever been objective, um, into this territory where we acknowledge our own positionality, who we are in the world, who I'm perceived as, uh, you know, given my own sort of position on the socioeconomic spectrum and that sort of thing. So acknowledging the influence we have with the people we interact with based on that, on that uh, position. Using really innovative visualization techniques like the ones I've shown to uh, use our imaginations and see what urban spaces can actually look like if transformed. Uh, we have all kinds of really cool 3D uh, scenarios that we've built over the last few years to show neighborhoods changing under, under climate change and what we can do in response to them. Opening up this conversation through crowdsourcing and social media, I ran a climate change MOOC a massive open online course a couple of years ago, uh, which was an awesome experience, um, that had about 15 or 20,000 students from around the world, and we all talked about climate change solutions, and it was uh, very feisty and challenging. Um, and of course, what we are doing, which is essentially participatory action research. So we are engaging in the product of the research and engaging directly with the communities uh, that we're working in, as well as studying them. So accelerating our progress along this pathway towards a more sustainable future uh, is obviously a challenging prospect. And um, before I sort of delve into Canadian policy very briefly, I just wanted to leave you with a couple of thoughts. How to accelerate this transformation? Knowing what we now know, we have some evidence that, that businesses see themselves as social actors, not just economic actors, um, that we're not just sort of rational utility maximizers and cost benefit maximizers. Um, and we know from behavioral psychology and behavioral economics that there is an irony here. And I think we at Waterloo should all take this to heart. I know it's awkward, but it's true. The science comprehension thesis, which I think many of us subscribe to without knowing, that the more we know, the better we are at making decisions and the better we are at, at understanding risks. So this is what we do as students, as faculty. We give you more information and we expect you to be better in the future. But there's a different way of, of thinking about the way people actually behave, which is the cultural cognition thesis. We interpret what we learn according to the values of the group we're in. So you take a really strong conservative over here, and you take a really strong liberal over here, and you give them the same facts, and you would think their positions might converge. And yet, we have evidence that this is not the case. They actually don't. They get better at arguing the position they previously held. So to take this seriously, we have to understand what actually motivates behavior. And filling a hole full of facts isn't necessarily what does it. That's tough. So we use reason not so much to improve knowledge and make better decisions, but to make arguments to persuade others. This is a different way of thinking about reason. So instead of filling the hole with facts and hoping better behavior comes out the other side, maybe we should take a different approach. And I think that this, will, this is informing our approach to small business engagement and to policy advice as well. That forced compliance can be expensive, but incentives, indirect suggestions, activating people's values, aligning with their role in the community, playing on the fact that we know that small businesses value community reputation as well as cost savings, um, doing very subtle signaling. I mean, this is just an example from health and nutrition, but um, there's all kinds of ways that we can subtly signal um, more responsible pathways. 
engagement has to go beyond this deficit model of filling that knowledge gap with some facts and then assuming the right behavior as we see it comes out the other end. And taking a broader notion of, of rewards. This is what we're hoping to do in a new uh, international um, partnership. This is risky to talk about this because it's just been submitted to SHRC two weeks ago. Um, we, have a, we submitted a letter of intent to a SHRC partnership grant last year and were successful in that, so we moved on to the full proposal which went in two weeks ago. And Transform is an international network of hubs of research and practice that will deepen our understanding of the drivers, barriers, and pathways to sustainability innovation. Our goal here is to build capacity in SMEs by knowing what we know about how people learn. So taking them to other businesses to actually see how they do things differently, to use visualization and storytelling to help them learn about their options. And then actually giving them money to do an experiment while we watch and support them and observe. So we want to break that barrier between observing and acting and to see real change on the part of these SMEs in nine different countries around the world. This is our awesome team. I won't go into any detail, but they're from um, nine or 10 different countries. So we're gonna have a hub in Australia and a hub in Germany and a hub in Sweden and here in the US. And then we're going to share the lessons that we learn. So this is what Transform will be when it's inevitably funded by Shark. <laughs> There's just no doubt in my mind. So we're bringing it all together and transform. The external factors, the internal factors, and trying to figure out how to transform urban systems towards sustainability. Before I finish, I just want to bring it home for all of us. So I mentioned that I'm this tainted academic and that I <laughs> engage in sort of the policy world as well as, as scholarship, certainly. Um, and this is a really interesting time for Canada on climate change and sustainability, as you all know. Um, in 2015, Canada's position changed rather dramatically. Uh, and so, um, and climate change has come sort of front and center in our radar. We could debate for days whether or not our actions are reflecting our rhetoric, but I'll just uh, put that out there. So we have a pan-Canadian uh, framework on climate change. We have a coast-to-coast -coast effort to debate decarbonization. We have a cap and trade, a carbon cap and trade system here in Ontario. Um, and the proposal for a, a nationwide carbon tax with all kinds of different feisty opinions about what's going to work and what's not. To feed into this process, I was part of a collaboration led by um, Professor Catherine Potvin at McGill, who similarly felt like scholars were abdicating if they didn't provide evidence-based um, research to policymakers as they were trying to navigate the climate change world. And we came up with uh, this um, position paper, which was a consensus-based report on solutions to climate change from Canadian scholars, and focused a lot on revising the Canadian identity from you know, hewers of wood and drawers of water and a resource-based economy to a renewable energy superpower that brought everybody along on this transformation towards sustainability. Um, that made a little bit of a splash, I guess, I don't know. Enercan, the Natural Resources Canada, um, approached us again this year to do the same thing, narrowing in on decarbonization. And so we have now this, uh, this report called Re-Energizing Canada, which is the product of an intentionally gender-balanced group of scholars from every province to discuss the challenge of deep decarbonization for Canada and frame it not solely as a technical issue, but as a social and cultural <laughs> challenge, a governance challenge. Um, so that was just recently released this spring and is now forming the foundation of this coast-to-coast -coast, uh, dialogue on decarbonization. What we found in that process regarding transformation is that our provincial propositions for reducing greenhouse gases will deliver our national target of 30% uh, reduction in GHGs by 2030. This will not keep us within two degrees of warming, but that's beside the point. We have absolutely no idea how to get here to 80% by 2050. The more radical goal of a, f of a deeper sustainability transition, we have absolutely no idea how to get there. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the transformative side. And so we propose an iterative, more holistic, kind of flexible approach to the governance of decarbonization that will be a force for reconciliation, that will be a force for inclusivity, 
um, and deliver on multiple sustainability priorities simultaneously. So if we t return to finish to our image of this deeply unsustainable city and envision what it can become uh, in a more sustainable future, we know that we have an abundance of tools at our disposal and we know this is the domain of, of many actors, not just one. It is a collective responsibility, but the way that capacity is distributed among those actors and their power to make change really, really varies. These are the answers we come up with to the questions that I answered. Transformation is happening. <laughs> Indeed it is, whether we like it or not. What is it? It's a dramatic shift in the logic, the values um, that underlie the way we interact with nature. Who participates? We all do, in one way or another. But we should pay more attention as scholars and as decision makers to the unusual suspects that really have the innovative potential to trigger change. What pathways can we follow? Well, it appears that the best ones in terms of delivering the most um, cohesive kind of suite of benefits and the most potential for progress are inclusive, holistic, and look for synergies between various issues that matter to us. And we can accelerate progress through better governance, not only or just technology. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for a very inspiring presentation. I must say you have eloquently illustrated the hugely important role that social sciences are going to play in helping humanity cope with climate change. And thank you very much for that. So we have time for a couple of questions, a few questions actually. But it's a bit of a complicated process because these proceedings are being webcast and this means that uh, anyone who speaks has to speak into a microphone. And I think we only have one microphone, is that right, Michelle? And you're going to move it around uh, to uh, the various people who have questions. So questions or comments, please, from folks in the audience. Faradon? I asked the first question, and I have to leave right after that. Sure. Sorry, Sarah, but thank you so much for this. In your decarbonization scenarios, now, do you consider it solar and wind? Mm -hmm. Is uh, nuclear, does nuclear enter into this uh, consideration? Uh, yeah, great question. Yes, we consider solar and wind. And uh, in trying to build a consensus among almost 80 scholars from different disciplines, we found, as you might expect, a fracture in our group on nuclear that we tried for many months to resolve and we ended up having to admit that we could not resolve it. <laughs> it was fascinating to watch, actually. I sort of want to write it all up because that's what I do. Um, but uh, there are those who fundamentally feel, obviously, that the risks associated with nuclear are just unacceptable. Um, and we can't plan for the time frames that we need to plan for to deal with waste and all of this. Others are saying deep decarbonization can't be done without nuclear. So you know, don't be naive and put it on the table. And your conversation is nuclear is only the fission, nuclear, mm, not yeah. fusion. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions, folks? Yes, up at the top there, Michelle. Um, so I had a question about models of risk. Mm -hmm. I uh, don't, I've never really worked with these issues from a scholarly standpoint, so I don't know the right language to use, but um, I've worked in water projects for a lot of years with a lot of people who would be innovators, mm -hmm. but what I perceive in my field is that these would be innovators, whether it's uh, individuals doing rainwater harvesting or businesses doing different streetscapes and infiltration, you know, all those LIDs and everything is that they inevitably run into regulatory hurdles. Mm -hmm. And I've worked also with regulating bodies, and I know that they prefer zero risk approaches. And that, to me, is a real big block. Yeah. Because, especially in water, zero risk means that your rainwater has to be drinking water quality. Right. And there's a real blockage there. So that innovation is stopped in its tracks. And I'm wondering if there are other models of dealing with risk that regulators have adopted? Maybe this is a bit nitty gritty, but um, because to me, there must be another way of uh, distributing risk or accepting it 
like accepting a certain amount of risk or allowing a license for innovators to not have to follow the same rules because yeah. their their issue is that they have to make the same rule for uh, somebody who's innovative and trying to experiment as for Joe Schlub who's going to let standing water in his front lawn. So that's the right. issue. Yeah. Um, so I won't speak specifically to regulators, but just in terms of a framing of risk, that's a really uh, crucial conversation that I feel sometimes like I have to, I play this role of the naive scholar when I'm talking to government and saying, listen, we need experiments and we need to be okay with failing. Because if you only pursue the experiments with 100% you know, uh, odds of success, you're not even remotely opening up the possibility of some real change, right? And so they say, yeah, great. So you don't have to get voted in three or four years from now or whatever. You're not accountable for taxpayer dollars. Failure is fine for you as a protected scholar. It's not fine for me. So I do think that you know, part of what we propose in Re-Energizing Canada is, and actually um, as part of an, an NCE, a, not, a Network of Centers of Excellence proposal, LOI, that just went in, is to do a coast-to-coast -coast sort of geographic um, uh, series of experiments as well, not just the small-scale stuff I'm proposing in Transform, but much bigger stuff, and try and have a, a conversation with um, civil society groups, with the public, about embracing a little bit of that failure. Because the reality is, and this is the, you know, how the argument seems to evolve in the US, we are already uh, committing to incredible risk, <laughs> right? It's, it, but it's always the, that risk is sort of unknown, I guess, and so it's the known risks that, that we deal with. It seems like the regulars want to do the projects themselves, but yeah. there's all these people that want to do this yeah. work for them, and it's just tricky to allow it to move forward yeah, while maintaining this zero risk You're right. approach. Yep. I don't know what the solution is. <laughs> Indeed. Neither do I. Embrace risk. I don't know. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, we have time yep. for one more question. Is reduction of income inequality on a global scale potentially bad for the climate? Is reduction of income inequality bad for the climate? If what you mean is that everybody is as rich as us, yes. <laughs> if what you mean is that it's more evenly shared and we shift away from a you know, disposable consumer culture, no. Yeah? OK. <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you for those uh, penetrating questions. Um, I have some too, but I'll have to wait until we can do it another time. Please join me once again, folks, in thanking Sarah for a, 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 a wonderful presentation.